This is episode 53 with Tamika Johnson. Welcome to Spot On Insurance. Join us each week as we speak to insurance professionals, attorneys, regulators, and compliance specialists on topics ranging from improving your agency to staying on the right side of the law. Subscribe and stay informed on the effects of new trends and disruptive emerging technologies on your businesses and your industry. Tamika Johnson brought a wealth of knowledge to Insurance Licensing Services of America when she joined the team in 2008. She graduated summa cum laude with honors from Baylor University with a major in political science and a minor in business, capping it off with a law degree from the University of Texas School of Law in Austin. Tamika currently serves as ILSA's Annuals and Corporates Supervisor. She assists the company's clients with corporate tax filings and annual returns, as well as Secretary of State's Certificate of Authority reinstatements and withdrawals. I'm glad I got that out. She is also responsible for supervising ILSA's Secretary of State registrations, corporate compliance reviews, DBA renewals with the Secretary of State, and Department of Revenue Business Tax Account Registrations. Tamika, welcome to Spot On. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Tell me, how did you get involved in law and uh, how did you end up in ILSA? Well, I graduated from uh, Baylor with a political science degree and a minor in business. And I went to University of Texas School of Law in Austin. And I did my law degree there. Uh, basically, was considering family law. I was like a CPS investigator for like seven months or so. Ended up coming to uh, ILSA 10 years ago. And since April 2012, I've been in the annual and corporate department, which is task compliance and compliance with the Secretary of State. I guess this is kind of a long question, but tell me about some of the challenges that your clients are facing when they ultimately come to you for help and how you end up eventually solving it for them. Well, one of the main things is that when our clients come in, uh, they get their license with the Department of Insurance, and then they have to register with the Secretary of State in order to get their certificate of authority to do business. Those clients, once they do that, they don't seem to realize that they need to file the annual terms for the Secretary of State. And your annual terms is basically like, you know, your director and officer information. Sometimes there's some shares information and you have to have a registered agent, which is basically someone that is located, physically located within that state and they have a physical address that can hand over any documents from the Secretary of State. So, you know, service of process or anything like that is forwarded to you by the registered agent. And we're seeing a lot of clients that that very first step they end up missing and that can lead to them being revoked in with the Secretary of State not in good standing because they didn't file their annuals and sometimes biannual uh, return. Have you seen revocations at all from some of your clients? Is it's just potential. That's usually like the main thing that we end up seeing uh, is revocations and, and it's usually linked to those annual return filings, not filing those. And that can lead to a reinstatement being required. And, you know, that could be like new forms being filed. That could be additional fee. And you're basically not in good standing to do business until that's resolved. So run through some other uh, other issues that you deal with when uh, with clients coming into your department. Another thing is the corporate tax returns. Now, it also files, you know, zero income and or the minimum state tax returns. And the minimum tax is usually like a franchise tax fee. We mm -hmm. have a lot of multi-state clients. Clients have licenses all over the country and they're maybe only based in their home state. And they seem to assume that since I'm not in, you know, state B, I uh, don't have any employees or an office there that I don't have to file anything. Well, you have a license that says that you are going to be soliciting and trying to get services there and you're registered with the Secretary of State. And so that does trigger those tax filing requirements. And sometimes, you know, those departments of revenue keep in contact with the Secretary of State offices and they and you can be forfeited um, at the Secretary of State level because you didn't pay your taxes. And also that can come into play when you're trying to reinstate or withdraw from that state. You could require a tax clearance and you're not going to get that tax clearance if you didn't file your taxes. And another thing that I've noticed, we have agencies that are disregarded entities and there's people that don't seem to understand that there are states that still require disregarded entities to pay uh, to file a tax return. So they're not exempt in all states. And the third issue that we also see is that, you know, if you have a, a tax preparer, that you have to keep them notified of any uh, changes in your tax structure, any changes of your fiscal year or ownership changes, especially like in our case, you know, we don't file the federal term. So uh, we're basically handling your non-resident state filings. So you definitely have to tell us that because any type of ownership changes, 
but all those things affect what goes on the tax return. So you need to notify them as soon as possible. If you know that your agency is about to be bought out, if you know somebody's going to be leaving, you got to tell them immediately. The fourth thing that I've seen, some Secretary of State offices, they require you to register with the Secretary of State before you get your license with the Department of Insurance. Once an agency decides, like, actually, I don't want to do business in that state, never mind, they may either never apply at all or you just go ahead and they cancel that license, but they forget to withdraw from the Secretary of State, which means that you still have an active registration with the Secretary of State, which means you have an active requirement to file an annual or biannual return and sometimes those tax returns. So you still need to withdraw to end that requirement. Right. And the last thing that we see is, you know, the failure to know the name that their agency is registered under the Secretary of State because the Secretary of State offices require that you pass the name availability requirement. So certain words like trust, you know, can be an issue uh, and getting mm-hmm. that name approval. So you end up having to use a completely different name. The word insurance, it depends on how you, you put the word insurance in your name before it can be approved sometimes. If you put a name in there and it's not really quite close to what you use, you need to keep track of that so that you can locate that record later on. Do you have any stories, anything you can share with us on clients that have gone through these issues? Well, we have a client that cannot, for the, for the life of them, get uh, their name approved because it has the word trust in it right now in Louisiana. They were approved in their home state but they can't get anyone to approve them um, in Louisiana for that. So they're having an issue trying to get a name uh, that can be listed there right now. It's kind of difficult getting that resolved. Uh, We've also had a client that went through mergers and name changes and ended up having three active records uh, with the Secretary of State in Texas, but they only had one agency that was actually still active. And so that ended up being, you know, a complicated uh, kind of issue where they had to basically get, try to get rid of the other two records and have it where they just have one agency that's in existence and only one agency that actually owes tax returns. And they were fortunate that the state of Texas allowed them to go ahead and get rid of those other records and have one listed. But, you know, we have, you know, again, one client right now where they registered their DBA in Oklahoma and then register their legal name later on. Now, Oklahoma, the tax commission, they require you to do a business registration application, which basically you have to apply to set up your tax account first before you can file taxes. And for some reason, they allowed both of these records there and only one of them has the tax ID. But the Oklahoma at this time would not allow that agency to move their tax returns to their legal name and just close out the other account. Um, they're uh, requesting that that client pay years and years of franchise tax returns, even though they already paid their franchise tax return. It's the same agency. Um, They have the tax returns. They have the fee. Uh, We can show that the tax ID goes to this legal name. They will not move it. And so right now they were trying to add a DBA to their record Mm -hmm. and they can't uh, because their legal name is listed as inactive for failure to pay taxes. And the taxes. Wait, but they paid the taxes, right? Yes, but they had uh, <laughs> they applied for they put their their legal they put their trade name in Oklahoma, and so they put that as their record. They won't acknowledge the other record that they're saying that the record is taken out. So your your job is partly to loosen up these knots that people get into because I mean, is this what you do on a regular basis? You're working with these people who have these problems. Some of it self-generated, but some of them, they just sound like they've fallen through the crack and the states just refuse to work with them to to make these changes. And then somebody's got to come in and try to help them resolve. Basically, that's kind of how we end up getting introduced to them. Either they're like a brand new company and they just um, don't want to deal with the compliance end of it at the very beginning. Or, you Mm -hmm. know, they're someone that they were handling in-house or they had someone who handled it for a long period of time and that person just left. And, you know, they're getting these notices now and those notices get forwarded to us and they're like, okay, what does this mean? What is this about? Basic questions end up being like, we didn't know we needed to do this. Oh, I see. So, so what you're talking about now is loss of personnel. They've got a person who's handling uh, their work at the office and this is their compliance person. And once that person goes, nobody knows what was going on. So by the time you get it, there's already a domino effect as a result of several things falling through the cracks and that's where you come in? Yeah, I mean, that can happen. And then, you know, agencies just basically 
getting all the licenses and doing the registrations, but not looking in advance um, for what can happen. So, you know, we have like suggestions for how they can avoid that as well. But I just wanted to bring up one final example on the things that can happen. We had an agency that applied in California. They're they're not bait, they're they're from Texas, but they registered in California as a domicile. And there was an agency there that had a similar name, but it wasn't them. Uh, they filed taxes in California for years, but it, it was being credited to a domicile California agency. Oh, and my that goodness. wasn't them. So they ended up having had to do a correct the registration to show that they're actually, you know, born. And so they were able to get the, the tax returns corrected and moved over. But it was kind of like you have to look at those applications because you make sure that you're not filling out a domicile when you need to be filling out a form. And, you know, partnership versus corporate, those things have consequences. So, yeah, make sure that you're from the get go filling out the right applications. So we're talking about a lack of attention to detail at this point for some of the uh, agencies or the agents that are working on this material. Really? Yeah, that, that can happen. Like, you know, there's a difference between a, a name availability issue and, you know, trying to put a trade name like that example I was talking about with that agency that they probably mm -hmm. could have registered under their legal name. In fact, I know they could have because there's another record with their legal name on there. But for some reason, they registered as, a, you know, a different name instead of right. their, their legal money when they had the option. So just things like that, that is having a long-term consequence probably was done by someone years and years ago. And here they are in present day trying to do a DBA and they cannot do it. To do or undo? <laughs> well, they're, well, they're trying to do something and they can't because they can't undo it. So, so it's kind of like, yeah. you know, I mean, I'm hoping that they won't have to pay years worth of taxes and pay like $100 for every year, but it, it happens. Like we have agencies that, when they try to withdraw, they've had to pay like 10 years worth of tax returns. And they're like, we never received a notice or anything. Well, you're getting it now. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's unfortunate. Well, on that trust, talking about that name change, is the reason that's so difficult to resolve because they want to use the word trust, they won't choose something else? Is that what's holding everything That up? was what was holding it up. I mean, what's kind of surprising but in that situation is that their home state allowed it. So you think like, you know, they would allow what the home state allowed for same for the same reason, but right now they're just being really hardcore on it, and we just don't want that word in there. Do you see other states not accepting this kind of stuff often, or is this just a, one of those things that just happens from time to time? Well, when they have a name availability requirement, that's when you have to start being concerned and looking in their legislation. And that's something also you know you should consider before you name your company if you're a brand new company that mm -hmm. there's just certain buzzwords that you know makes makes the secretary of state say we don't really want that in there something to look into um before you okay. pick that name and those are things you help folks with well you know we can help them with the states like if they don't know the name availability requirement rules uh, that's something that we can go back to. we can go to the state and we can go back to them and try to come up with the resolution uh basically by the time they come to us they already have their name and their articles and everything set up okay. just basically trying to get them through so you could streamline the process from the beginning yeah once they come in if you have a company come to you from the very beginning, they're just starting to set everything up. It makes it so much easier for you because you know all the steps in the process. But what often happens is you're coming in in the mill, right? Where people have already created these problems and they have these issues and your job is then to solve these issues, yeah. right? Yeah. And we have like, I, mean, I can tell you probably briefly like five things that we consider, you know, something that they should start doing, uh, especially like uh, the agency comes to us and they want to join annuals and uh, corporate tax return services. The main thing that we ask them up front is, okay, you came to us because you got a notice and you, you have this one problem, but this is a good time to audit your records. And it's something that we offer and we offer, call it the corporate compliance review. And it's basically checking to see if you have like an active license with the Department of Insurance, if you have an active registration with the Secretary of State, and we give you your information, like your file number with the state and your, mm -hmm. you know, whether or not you're your registered agent and whether or not you're behind on your annual returns. Because just because you have a notice from one state, because not all states are equal on those notices, I'm just telling you, uh, mm -hmm. this is your chance to find out up front is if there's an issue. And then we can go back and fix what the issue is and just make sure going forward, you're good. Okay. And like we were talking about before, like those people, the brand new clients, like we, we've been getting clients who are coming in from Canada and they're coming into the United States. And uh, I know we were talking to one client, he's Canadian in California. And he was like, 
you know, we, we were just thinking like, you know, we want to register in like in the big states. And it's, that sounds like a good strategy, but you have to think up front, especially if cost is a concern. If you're not really doing that much business in that state, do you need to have a license and a registration there? And if you are and you, you're just ready to go and do it, that's fine. But you need to know if there's Secretary of State filing requirements, especially if the tax filing requirements as well. We get so many clients who are like, we don't do $8 for the business in the state. But, you know, it's California and it's $800, <laughs> you know, minimum franchise Whoa. every year. So it's like, if you do that, you need to, once it's done, you're, you're just stuck with that. So you end up spending a lot more money on dealing back and forth with the state than you're saying than you actually yeah, do any business yeah, at all. Yeah, you don't want your compliance costs to be more than your what you're making in business. That's you that, know that doesn't make any that makes sense. sense. Especially <laughs> especially like if you have a full time employee that's their job to do that, or you have like an outside vendor doing that, and you're paying costs, uh -huh. you need to be making some type of money doing some type of business there. Otherwise, it's like it just isn't ends up becoming like a cost. Spot On is sponsored by Insurance Licensing Services of America. Need help with corporate name changes, annual returns or surplus lines tax filings? Feeling overwhelmed? If you're looking for experts in regulatory compliance, you've come to the right place. ILSA provides the industry with over 50 services. To learn more about the company and how they can help, visit ilsainc.com. This company that you're talking about, so the idea was, I want to do this in 20 states, let's say, but they're only going to do business in two. So you're saying they were trying to do this ahead of time to make sure that they were registered there and that's what's not a good idea. It's better to wait. Well, they were just starting and they were just like, just guessing like the big states and it's kind of like, well, did you have a plan to start doing business in those states? Or are you just going to start randomly getting licenses in the biggest states? you know, in the country, because those are the ones that are probably going to have, you know, okay. some, some major tax or requirements, you know. So in this particular case, what would you suggest? If that, that, that person came from the beginning, what was your suggestion to them? How do they proceed? What was the best course of action? Yeah, and, and I'm glad I, I've suggested it to other clients as well. And I'm glad that, you know, some of them are taking me up on it before they get a license, before they do a registration, they actually come back and they ask, okay, hey, what is the cost? Is there a requirement? And if there is, what is the cost? And is, is it every year? Is it every other year? So they ask and they go back to their company and they make the decision, okay, like, is this something that we need to do before they apply? So they, they apply for the license. If they need it, they go ahead and apply, but at least they go in knowing what the requirements are and what the costs are. And they take that into consideration before they do it. But even more importantly at this point, I think, what are the pitfalls? I mean, what happens... What kind of trouble can you get into as a result of doing that and then not taking care of those little nitpicky things? Well, that's why I like, okay, like on number three, like the main, one of the things that we highly recommend is having some sort of reminder system because not all states send notices, but, you know, there's ways that you can either have things emailed to you or you can have an outside vendor track it for you or you can have somebody in your mm -hmm. service, but you need to stay on top of that. The consequences, again, you know, is having you end up being revoked and have your right to do business taken away in that state. So you have to stay on top of it. But once you do it and it, it's great, you know, you caught it the first time that it was due, but you need to catch it every single time for as long as you're registered there. Yes. And if you're not doing business, then you've got a lot of work that you're doing uh, that you're looking out for, even though you, you don't have any, any money coming in. Yeah. And, and, the, and the fourth thing, um, the registered agent. And like I was saying earlier, your registered agent needs to have a physical address in that state. Cause that's where they do your service process. When you get those notices, please have someone there that actually reads them. Because we have documents like we'll do, we have one client right now where the task clearance, you know, for either the withdrawal or the reinstatement that we're doing was sent to the, this agency. The agency is huge, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's huge. He never gets it, you know? So it's kind of like you have to have someone at the company in your mailroom, if you're like a super big company, that understands that the notices that come from your registered agent is important and needs to be forwarded to someone. They forward tax account IDs. They they send like the SOS, some of those uh, Secretary of State sites have PIN numbers that are needed for the filing. Right. That's important. Your file numbers for this, you know, the states, whether or not you're forfeited, all those things are coming to you from your registered agent and your reminders too. But all those things you need to keep 
if you're not processing that, you need to forward that to your to your accounting department or your outside vendor that's handling that. Every time some of these dominoes falls, you're you're telling me they're not reading the material that's coming in from the registered agent, right? Yeah, a lot of times they're not, or it's just going into a mailroom and going I don't know where. I just know like especially when we're there's certain documents that goes to the agency, it doesn't come to us. So when it goes to the agency, that's something that they need to forward to their to their vendors so they can handle. But that's clearly not happening. And it, especially in those large companies, mm-hmm. somebody gets in there for like, oh, big whoop to do. I'm like, it's it's a big deal. You have to keep uh, your pins. You got to keep your account numbers. Those things are needed for filing. And those things are needed for your returns. That's your Department of Revenue is saying that this is the number that your tax return is listed under. So you have to keep that. This is a big deal. But how have they been uh, slapped across the hand for not taking care of this? What could, what kind of uh, things have you seen? Well, you can be forfeited. Like say, for instance, in the state of Texas, they send out reminders. They still mail them, actually, uh, every year with the franchise tax returns. Uh, and they have like the web file number on there that you need. Uh, if you wanted to follow up with the state or if you wanted to file it on your account, mm-hmm. it tells you when it's due. And if you miss a return, they actually give you, you know, oh, you have like a little bit of a grace period to go ahead and file it. But if you drag on and on and you don't do it, they revoke you with the secretary of state. You're, you're forfeited for taxes and you end up having to file those back tax returns and there's a $50 late penalty. And then you have to do a reinstatement and there's a fee for the reinstatement and all these things. And it's not like, and they tell you upfront when it's due. And they give you a little bit of time to to handle it. They actually do follow up. So it's a matter of, you know, just read the notice. And if you don't know, there's a number on there. You can contact someone and they can help you out. You know, uh, the Texas Franchise Tax Return has no, if you don't meet the threshold, no fee. So you're just basically end up paying money for not filing, Ah, you know. Okay. It's a very, you know, it's kind of straightforward filing. Out of these uh, steps that you're talking about, these are really steps that an agency can take to to ensure that they stay in compliance? Yes. And, and my last and my last one here, uh, the fifth one here is like, like you're saying, you know, if you cancel your Department of Insurance license, you need to immediately withdraw from the Secretary of State. If you know like you're about to do a number, sometimes people choose to number new if it's about to expire pretty soon. If it's going to be a pretty lengthy time before it expires, uh, I would go ahead and submit a license cancellation for the part of insurance. Mm-hmm. But you definitely need to withdraw from the Secretary of State because as long as you're registered, we've had clients who did not have a license, either never had it or canceled the license, you know, and were filing tax returns and annual returns for years, you know, for years. And all they had to do was withdraw from the Secretary of State and that would have been canceled. So it's something that don't just think about one department. It's the Secretary of State. It's the Department of Revenue. And if you have to withdraw or reinstate, sometimes that you have to add in there the Department of Labor. Uh, even though you have no employees, you still have to try to get a tax clearance from them too, depending on the state. So you can't just think Department of Insurance, Department of Insurance. Yeah, I think about the other agencies, especially Secretary of State. So how do I keep up with all these different agencies that I've got to deal with? Do I keep up because I'm getting all these notifications from them? I mean, I mean it's, it's fine it's to so- get notifications, but if you don't have someone... Uh, at your office or an outside vendor that is, is, you know, their job to follow up on your compliance because that's what this is. It is compliance. You know, it's not like just some random little thing like your taxes are due every year. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> These annual returns are for the most part due every year. These state tax returns are tagged to your to your federal return. So even though you may not have income on there, you still have to pay that franchise returns once you you file your federal return, you got to start thinking, okay, what are these other state returns, tax returns that I owe? You know, what are these annual returns for the Secretary of State that I owe? If you do not have time to do that, then you need to either have a person there that does or you need to to outsource it. But that's compliance and it's not going away. Do you find that perhaps agencies don't pay enough attention to getting that, let's say it's in-house, getting the right person to do that job? Because They run into these problems so much? Yeah, I think they're thinking a lot about making the money and doing the business, the the insurance sales. And they're not really thinking about the compliance that allows them to do that. And then, you know, sometimes they'll give it to a certain person. Like we had a client recently and we were trying to tell them that you need tax clearances uh, for these withdrawals. And he was like, well, my CPA said we don't need tax clearances. So I had to go, you know, and find you know, the law, copy it and email it to him. It was like, you do. Like he had one 
uh, was Texas and you need a, a task clearance for that. And the other one was New Mexico. You need three task clearances for that from three different departments. So, you know, CPA is, is a genius. I'm not saying that he wasn't a smart person. Sometimes because somebody's a, a CPA or a lawyer doesn't mean that their specialty is compliance. Here, so he was giving advice outside the area of his expertise, really. Well, unless he's constantly does withdrawals or reinstatements, and you know, if that's his background, and I don't know that. I mean, I don't, all I know is like in this particular area, he gave his client the wrong advice on that. So when we brought it to him, he was like, "Fine, we want you to handle that, and we'll have our CPA handle the tax returns, which is perfectly fine." And so not only do you have pitfalls from the state, but then you have pitfalls from your advisor if you have the wrong advisors who can lead you the wrong way by just easily giving you some information that they think is correct, but it's not. I mean, because it's not their area as in this case. Yeah. And like I, you know, like I was saying, like the discarded Andes earlier, I had a client that brought in their their CPA and I'm trying to explain to them, discarded Andes do owe tax returns in these states. And that's something that, you know, right now they, they wanted to handle in-house, but if you don't know that it's required, you're not handling it in-house. So basically by coming to us, you know, I can, I was sending him the law and sending him the rules on it from the state. Um, that was something that his, his CPA was like, you know, was grateful for the information. He did not know that that was the case. He assumed that it was just everything just follows what I guess the federal is saying. Like these states have their own rules. They don't have to say a disregarded entity doesn't have to follow. These cases are definitely not as open and shut. They're not easily dealt with. No, I mean, if you do... I mean, a lot of our things that we have is, is, is comes up because of research uh, from that. But it's basically like if a, if a client comes to you and they, they're they like, you know, we're registered. We have a notice, especially if we have a notice from the state that we need to file. That would be the first tip off. But then that's the only issue that's getting resolved. It's not getting resolved in the other states that have that rule if you don't know, if you don't know that it's required. So going to somebody that specializes specifically and mm-hmm. Secretary of State filings and specifically in minimal franchise tax filings. That's something that that is helpful. If that is something that, you know, that's the main thing that that person does. A lot of the stuff that you do is uh, research and problem solving for your clients. I like the research and I like the compliance. I mean, the rules can change every single year, especially on the tax side. Um, it's good to be able to work with people who are in the industry and get to have that communication with the states. Because they have also those people on the other side of the, the aisle in the Departments of Revenue. They're specialists, too. They specialize in what their state's laws, their state's rules. And so you're constantly working with them. And it's an education. When those rules change, those people are extremely helpful. Um, and they allow us to get that help to our clients. And then we're in contact with their CPAs and their attorneys. It's something that, you know, it keeps you on your toes. Do you find yourself helping a lot of CPAs and attorneys in the job that you do? Well, we end up, you know, like, especially like if the CPA or the attorney doesn't have time to, to deal with that, because their main priority is supposed to be the federal returns. And it takes, especially on those really, really big companies, you know, it takes a long time to get those federal returns done, a very right. long time. And so you're talking about a franchise tax return is very, you know, very minimum. Especially if it was something that, you know, the disregard India or something that they didn't even know was even required. They'll, they'll provide the information, but then they probably would just want you to just go ahead and handle it, get it filed and get it processed. Is it getting better? Because we hear about all these changes. You've got new technology coming in. What are you seeing? Is, it, is the system improving from state to state or still continue to be somewhat broken? The main changes that we're seeing is that, uh, especially on the tax side, and something is a change that I really appreciate. There's different types of software, but then you have software that's not compatible with all states. And so I'm really appreciating the states that create their own tax account sites and allow you to file it through the state, which is the best way for me. Because especially like if it's minimum, just the minimum filing, it should be able to be processed on that agency's, on that state's website. So you're saying that it makes the job easier. It's more streamlined for you. It's making it more streamlined. Like Maryland just recently made a, a change to their annual return where you can file the annual return separately from the personal property return this year. And so basically, if you don't have any property in Maryland, you don't have to deal with that personal property return. You just file the annual return. And that's something that makes it more streamlined and more easier. There's no reason to file something that if you don't have any property there. It's like, why well, file that? So now it's just, you know, you just file the annual return. You know, we don't mind here at ILSA if a client just has a question, they can contact us at any time and we're willing to help. But just know that you know, once you commit 
and especially once you register with the Secretary of State, that there's compliance concerns going forward and make sure you have a strategy of plan uh, to deal with that immediately. If somebody needs your help, how do they contact you? Will they contact me at tjohnson at ilsainc.com? Okay. And they just shoot me an email. And also they can call our uh, general number, 254-729-8002. And they can reach out to anyone that, you know, depending on their compliance needs to have a question about. And we can help you out with anything that you need. My guest today has been Tamika Johnson. Tamika, thank you so much for helping to educate our listeners. Yeah, no problem. Visit spotoninsurance.com, where you'll discover an ever-growing library of podcasts, videos, articles, and online tools by professionals for professionals to enhance your insurance education. By the way, that's where you'll also find our podcast notes and bonus resources. Please don't forget to click the iTunes link to rate and review and let others know what you think of Spot On Insurance. Thank you for joining us, and we'll catch you next week.